Anthony Magnol. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker, and it's a pleasure to be able to speak in this debate. And can I start by saying how uh, sorry I am not to see the member for Shetland and Orkney in his place. He has been a strong voice on this topic. He has a font of knowledge and understanding of the sector, and he always adds great weight to this subject. And can I also start by saying what a pleasure it is to follow the Honourable Gentleman for Strangford. Um, he is an ever-present and indeed continual voice in every debate on this subject, and it's helpful to give us a UK-wide perspective of how we can help this sector. Mr Deputy Speaker, I am the Chair of the All-Party Parliamentary Actually, I'm not the Chair, I beg your pardon. I'm the Treasurer of the All-Party Parliamentary Group on Agriculture, uh, and my colleague, uh, the Member for Baron Furness, is the Chair, and we've had great success over the last few months in trying to push the agriculture sector, and I'm particularly grateful to colleagues from across the House who have joined that group. And if I may, Mr Deputy Speaker, I'm going to focus my remarks on both aquaculture and fishing and some of the problems that are faced by the sector and hopefully end by reinforcing that I think there are huge opportunities in this sector but they have yet to be recognised, they have yet to be seized upon and we actually need to do more in this place to talk about this sector to see how we can build it up across the entire of the United Kingdom. Mr Deputy Speaker, the first is around Pacific oysters. Um, for those of us that have them in our coastal waters, and I recognise this is not across the whole of the United Kingdom, they are incredibly prevalent they are incredibly uh, productive and they are incredibly delicious. Uh, unfortunately, though, we have got to a point where DEFRA's position, which is a historical one, is that they are invasive and therefore um, they should not be cultivated. Now, I see my co colleague from Cornwall shaking her head because this is a different situation for them in Cornwall, and I'm making the point from a Devon perspective, so before she intervenes and tells me I'm wrong, I make this point. We need to look at where where uh, Pacific oysters are being empowered and where they are actually growing at an alarming rate because of climate change, because of water temperatures rising, and we need to think about how we can actually utilise that. And in terms of food security, this is one such way. In fact, if DEFRA were to change its policies from rather invasive to naturalised, we could actually allow businesses to be able to harvest them, sell them, and grow the market. And I give the example at the moment. Because of DEFRA's wording on this subject, I have both landowners and the Duchy of Cornwall now restricting licenses of those who are currently operating in my area. I have three businesses at the moment who are about to go out of business because they cannot get a renewal on their contract. This is a very easy line change. It is one that can help our markets across the UK. And in fact, if you look at just the sheer economics of this sector, compared to, the, uh, compared to France, they outperform us by about tenfold in this area. So there's money to be made, there's businesses to be created in coastal communities. The second thing that has been particularly damaging for uh, the agriculture sector has been around water quality. You know, around 80% of shellfish harvesting waters uh, in the UK don't meet uh, the standard Class A requirement for export. And the confusion when we left the European Union of whether or not we would still be able to export from Class B waters has only compounded that problem. We need to have a better conversation about how we're going to allow aquaculture businesses to be set up and created and whether or not we could do it in highly protected marine areas. If you take live bivalve mollusks or Pacific oysters or razor clams or scallops, not a single chemical is poured on them. They are, they are, where, they are, where they are grown, where they are harvested, they actually help enhance marine biodiversity. If we can get this right, you can find a way in which you actually make highly protected marine areas all the more productive for improving marine biodiversity. And the second is around, oh, sorry, the third, I beg your pardon, is around what we do in terms of EU trade flows. And already the gentleman from Banff and Buchan has made this point. The Class B problem has restricted many businesses. And I know DEFRA has moved already in terms of um, beneath the 50 de 53 degree line across the United Kingdom where businesses um, can export and where we've recognised new areas as Class A. But we have to think about how we're testing because we wrote, the UK wrote the rules in the European Union on how to test our waters. But we are perhaps the most stringent in employing them and performing it in the strictest manner. So you have the French and the Dutch and the Germans who all test their waters using our rules but to a lesser standard and the right of appeal in the UK is not there. So I give you one example, uh, of course. Does my honourable friend agree that this is yet another example of the UK government gold plating um, legislation unnecessarily? 
I couldn't fail to disagree with the Honourable Lady. She's absolutely right on this. We have to look at how we can make the laws that we've passed work. And it's not about lessening standards. It's not about looking at how we can um, put people's health at risk. It is about making sure that we can work with businesses and give them certainty. I have an extraordinary business that operates out of Brixham, but, and its, and it's uh, harvest waters are in Lime Bay, um, uh, so, and uh, called offshore shellfish. They are constantly at the risk of a poor rating, which would then see them put out of business for a year. A business simply can't operate on that basis. So we must look at reviewing those appeals. I know CFAS, CFAS have worked together with the FSA on this issue, but any impetus from the Minister would be incredibly helpful um, to get this across the line. Again, this costs no money. It will create businesses, it will create jobs, it will create opportunities, and it will create a fantastic, sustainable um, source of food. I mean, I, I've got in front of me here the figures uh, compared to France, and it's the UK produces 0.9 tonnes per kilometre of coastline. In France, it's 17.3 tonnes per kilometre of coastline. That is the scale of how much of a disadvantage we are at in terms of what we could, uh, uh, and, and, and certainly what we could do and what we could achieve across our coastal uh, waters and our coastline, and indeed are helping to level up within coastal communities. Around fishing, Mr Deputy Speaker, it's already been mentioned a number of times, but uh, fishermen's medical certificates. There isn't a single person in here who wants to see any lowering of standards or safety for fishermen. We've, we not only understand how difficult fishing is, but we understand the risks that go with it. And what we're asking the government to look at is just putting in the exemption for the under 10 metres not to have the medical certi certificate requirement. Now, there's already a law in place to allow there to be an exemption, which is Regulation 14. I have to say, Minister, and I, I hope this doesn't come across pompous, but when we had a meeting with a minister um, from the Department of Transport, I have never heard a minister speak with such contempt of this sector. And to just say that it was automatically going to be implemented without consultation, I'm sorry to be so candid about it, but I think it's a very shoddy way to treat a sector that actually needs our support, of course. Would my honourable friend agree as well that that minister did not seem to have a grasp of the MAIB, the Marine Accident Investigation reports that are available, and it was very clear that she had not looked at them to see if there was evidence to introduce this legislation? The Honourable Lady is absolutely right, and she was far more diplomatic than I was during that meeting, which probably means her career in the Foreign Office is likely to be far greater than mine. But I actually tabled a question on this subject in here asking how many people in the last four years had died at sea or had serious injury from a medical condition. And the response was not a single one of the deaths or the emergency requirements. Uh, I will in a second. Not a single one of the deaths or emergency responses was down to a medical condition. It was down to poor practice. It was down to poor equipment. So we are putting in legislation that is causing huge horror and difficulties. I'm going to go to the Honourable Gentleman now. I'll come back to you. But we must think about why we're putting these things in. If we want to change the practice and make sure things are safer on vessels, let's do that. And we'll work hand in glove with them. But to think that this won't impact the very num the number of small boat owners, small inshore fishermen who are on our coastal waters is just nuts. Yes. I'm very grateful to the uh, Honourable Gentleman for giving way, and he makes that point exceptionally well. Indeed, he echoes some of the concerns and the arguments put forward by the Welsh Fishermen's Association. He mentioned there about the lack of evidence. Um, does it not then perhaps uh, reflect the fact that the drafters of the regulations foresaw the potential for exempting the smaller vessels by giving the Secretary of State the power to do so? Well, the Honourable Gentleman in his intervention has made the point perfectly, which is that if the exemption is there, let us use it. It takes nothing other than the Minister standing at the dispatch box to say that Regulation 14 will be used, and I'm getting the sense, Mr Deputy Speaker, that there may be some cross-party support on this. Yes. Uh, I'm grateful for him giving way. I was in that meeting as well, and uh, I don't wish to add to the pile in on the Minister, but I think there is a point here about how regulations should be implemented. Yeah. There is a real problem with how this particular regulation is being implemented, and will he agree with me that the way to build trust between the sector that feels put on and over-regulated is for the MCA, DFT, 
and possibly DEFRA to make sure that there is renewed trust between that sector, because the absence of that trust is not going to deliver the regulatory outcomes that the Minister wants, and it's only going to further corrode the already tense relationship between the fishing industry, especially small boats, and those that seek to regulate them. The Honourable Gentleman makes a fantastic point on this, and communication is key on this. We are not trying to overload the sector. We want to make sure that we can do all the right steps in the right way, but that means that organisations like the NCA and DEFRA are going to have to be very clear and concise. And I have to say, you know, I say this to the, the Minister and, and also to the Fishing Minister, I'm sure is watching, they have been very proactive in engaging with us and very clear about this. So it's not me having a dig at them, yes. Thank you. And I'm sorry to take up so much of your time. Um, but as someone whose husband suffered a fatal accident aboard his under 10 metre fishing vessel, can I honestly say, and do you agree, that when his toggle got caught in the net drum of his boat, no medical certificate issued by his GP would have prevented that? I absolutely agree. And as ever, the Honourable Lady adds huge weight and huge knowledge to the debates on this topic. And I hope uh, both officials and ministers um, across all departments are listening to the points that we're making. Uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, I'm taking up far too much time, but I'll just make uh, three other quick points. And I should also mention that my, our colleague from Truro and Falmouth was also uh, unable to be in this debate, but wanted to emphasise that actually around medical certificates, she is very much aligned with the views that have been expressed across this House. Um, the second area of concern around is uh, around uh, the fishing is the IVMS side of things. I mean, it's been a difficult programme to roll out, and we've got to ensure that the MMO must learn from the shambles of the type of approval process and not repeat it. Um, the MMO has to, as the Honourable Gentleman for Plymouth has already said, be open, be transparent, and communicate in full with uh, the fishermen and the fishing community as well. And that brings me on to the catch app. I'm perfectly willing and happy to accept that modern technology has a place in how we fish and how we farm, and we must use it to full advantage. But it's still not functional. You still can't enter some port uh, locations or species or differentiate between male and female crabs. Um, the computer literacy and indeed the connectivity in some places across this country are of hugely varying quality. So I think there needs to be a little bit of understanding. And what I have seen is fishermen in my own community suddenly issued with non-compliance letters many, many months after the alleged incident happened. This is only adding to the stress of a sector that is really under the cosh at the moment and needs more support. So we need to... Um, yes, I will. I'm grateful I'm giving uh, away a second time. Um, uh, the catch app and the type verification for IVMS, I think, are two good examples of overburdensome regulation. The threat of criminality, if you can't successfully weigh your fish in 10% of its weight while at sea without marinized scales, seems to be massive overgrown, homegrown, burdensome, costly red tape that puts additional stress. Would he agree that there must be a better way of doing this to make sure that fishes can be taken with government in where they change their laws, not pitched against them? Yes, and actually I think where I think we've seen huge progress is that the Minister, the Fishing Minister has been extremely proactive on this. I, I hope I'm not speaking for him when I say he has told me that he agrees with the points that we're making. But it's actually about how the MCA is putting this in and regulating it. So we have to make sure that what we say in this chamber, what is being said in departments, is actually translating through to the organisations that are there to enforce it. And if we can get that right, then we can suddenly do all the things that the Honourable Gentleman is saying and all the, all, all the things that we're saying on this side. Um, Mr Deputy Speaker, the last point I'd just like to make is that we've spoken a little bit about um, Brexit. There are huge opportunities outside of the common fisheries policy, and Brixham has been a fantastic example in my constituency of a fishing port that has had record sales since 2021. In 2021, it sold 43 million. Then in 22, 60 million. This year, it's on course for 63 million pounds worth of sale. Next year, it's forecasting 67 million pounds of sale. And by 2027, they're expecting to top over 100 million pounds worth of sales. They prepared for Brexit. They are taking advantage of it. There are new boats coming online. There are new boats being built. The capital allowance that the government has done is a huge support to the sector. So don't think it's about us being doom and gloom about the sector. It's about us ensuring 
ensuring that we can recognise the difficulties that are being faced, as some have said, by gold-plated you know, legislation and rules and regulations, but actually trying to unlock it, making it easier, making it simpler, and really talking up the sector. And I just would like to finish on this one point, Mr Deputy Speaker, is that we do need to talk a lot more about food security in this country, and we do need to talk about how we can be more self-sustainable. Our coastal waters offer that opportunity to do it, and we must make sure that when we come back with the uh, three, every three-year uh, report on food security, that fishing and aquaculture are fully embedded in helping us answer that, that call for better food security, better, food, better local food on our plates. Um, and on that point, Mr Deputy Speaker, I'll say that it's a privilege to be able to speak on behalf of the fishing community within my constituency and to know that so many colleagues across this House share similar views.